what are the commonalities among leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time. Ryan, so as I was preparing for a time, I was um, I was just fascinated by your story. So we're going to definitely get to some of your work and your ideas, which are also awesome. But I, I, I have to kind of shift how I would normally do this and focus more on you. So I, I th- as I was doing research, I saw an Instagram post of yours and it was about your dad. And, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have amazing parents who are like the, the heroes of my life to this day. And you, you, your dad was wearing a, I believe a, a uniform of United States air force. That's right. That's and right. on the, for your caption, you said you, you, you thanked him for a service and you said that him and your mom, uh, paved the way. And I, so I love to start this by talking about love um, and family. Can you share more about your parents and how they paved the way for you? Oh, well, of course. Thank you for having me on, on, on the show. My, so my yeah. parents, I really do look up to both of them and they truly have paved the way for my, my two brothers and I. So my dad, let's talk about my dad and then we'll talk about mom, my mom. They both are, are truly inspirations, but my, my dad you know, came to the US when he was 16 or 17, right? Really young. Uh, wasn't a citizen, uh, was working, you know, he at a gas station and really trying to figure out how to get an education and really the path. And for him, joining the military, actually enlisting in the Air Force was not only a path to becoming a citizen of the United States, but also getting an education, a great education, and also doing really good work. And so he enlisted as a teenager into the United States Air Force. Um, there are these photos of like one yearbook that we have, and it's my dad, you know, full shaved head, uh, sitting kind of in a classroom, uh, uh, like thing. And and there's that photo. And then the one that you saw on Instagram where he's sitting actually in kind of his uniform. Um, and that path for him was really becoming and learning to be an engineer, a civil engineer, really building things. Um, my dad was in the air force for, eight years before becoming a civilian working for the military, right, as the Department of Defense. But his career took him and my mom all around the world, right? He was based in the Air Force in the U.S. and then Guam and a few places. But then when he became a civilian, my mom and dad lived in Adak, Alaska. So think Alaska, and then you see the long chain of islands. Uh, My dad and mom were, were based there. That's actually where my mom became a citizen, was actually in Adak, Alaska, um, and, uh, she was working, what did she work? She worked, I think at the, at the, uh, on the school playground there for all the military kids. And hmm. they loved the life there because you literally have this small base town. The purpose of it was truly cold war activities right around it being a sub base, as well as probably, uh, fl- doing flight missions. Um, the Island is so windy that, it's got just one line of trees and it's got this sign that says you are now entering and leaving Adak Alaska's national forest. And so, you know, they were there for a set of years. They then went to the Philippines because there was a Navy base there, wherever there was building need to be done. My dad was, you know, part of the teams that were there. Um, That's where I was born. I was born in the Philippines, lived there for three years. Uh, We then went to Germany, Uh, Germany. This is before the wall went down. Um, and of course, more projects that, that, my, that my father was working on. And then when the wall went down, um, we moved down to Naples, Italy. And so I lived seven years in Naples, Italy uh, because of Gulf Storm and the stuff that was needed there. And so for a lot of my like upbringing was always being around uh, the, you know, the U.S. Uh, uh, and our like place in the world, right? The role that we play, this responsible steward, but also, you know, growing up, going to the military bases for groceries, going there for the exchange and, you know, um, uh, and seeing like that lifestyle, right? Everyone was, you know, Mr. and Miss. And like, I I loved it. I loved growing up that way. Um, We ended up moving back stateside when I was in high school and uh, middle school, high school time. And so we moved to, of course, San Diego because there's a military base they are both the Marine Corps down south, sorry, the Marine Corps up north with Camp Pendleton, and then the, um, the Navy base is more closer to, to, to San Diego proper. Um, but just, you know, my parents and their 
my mom ended up actually working as a civilian as well too for the military and she still does today she works down in Coronado for the the naval special warfare group that's down there she works on the hr side on the you know diversity inclusion as well as like keeping you know great healthy workplaces around she worked at camp pendleton for a long time too so there's a lot of military and service flowing through like our our family um Mm -hmm. and when i was thinking about what i wanted to do uh going into college i remember my parents saying something along the lines of like hey ryan we served so you can go do what you want to do right go Mm -hmm. be an engineer go do film go do what you want to do but you know, we're still working for, you know, the US and for our country, like you go do your thing. And so it was always very interesting that, you know, what, 14, 15 years later from that moment, going back into government and doing civil service, right? Like following in my parents' footsteps is just a, they are incredible people. They are service oriented. They are builders. Um, You know, they believe like with the strong, you know, my dad is always the believer with a strong education you can do anything kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about them. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's so cool. I mean, you, you got hired by, so I, I know as part of your career, you worked at Salesforce, worked at Microsoft, worked on some big things, but then as you, as you just touched on, you get hired by president Obama to be the deputy deputy chief technology officer of the United States uh, of our country. So you go into public service, obviously those jobs, you don't do them for the money. Um, you do them to serve, uh, a couple things about this. One, how did you earn the job? And two, like, what, what was it like? I mean, what, what was that job like uh, uh, when you had a taste of kind of the big job like Salesforce, Microsoft, sure. huge projects that are that are uh, about you know earning profits and 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 doing well for a company versus yeah. being a leader for our country and being tapped on the shoulder by the most powerful person in the world. What was that like, man? And how did you, for, yeah, two parts. How did you earn it? And then what was it? Of like? course. Yeah. So on the earning side, let's start there. Cause it, the, the experience in DC was surreal. Absolutely surreal. Um, a six month stint turned into three and a half years, but um, the earning part was really built around at least the way that I see the world right now. And I think for your listeners that are maybe in college or on the younger side, I always see things kind of in these four year increments, right? We had, high school where we get to develop ourselves. There's this college period of time. There's this four years after college. And then there's the four years after that. And then when you're kind of in your mid thirties, you start to look at life in more of the decade time span, right? It's like, what am I going to do this decade? That's going to be meaningful. But for me, those four years, you know, at college were really about learning as much as I can, I could. And where'd you go to college? I went to Berkeley. Okay. I went to Berkeley okay. and um, I remember when I applied to Berkeley, I, I was leaning more on my creative side of my brain. And my dad was like, you know, go to Berkeley for engineering and you can do anything else you want. And so I was like, okay, fine. I'll do that, dad. Of course, there were a lot more tears and things like that uh, involved in that. But I'm really thankful because, you know, you go to a place like Berkeley or any college, really nothing stopping you from doing two degrees at once or like exploring other, you know, classes. And so what I did there was, I did industrial engineering and I did, uh, I helped start the TV station there, right? Like leaning on my creative side. And I think what you learn in life is there's the hard, you know, like wrench kind of coding kind of building side of things. But storytelling is incredible because storytelling creates movements and can inspire people. And so you combine the two, like really good things can happen. Um, I was uh, applying for jobs out of college and I was leaning heavily on like trying to get a marketing job. And I did like 20 interviews. No one would call me back. And um, uh, and and I, th- I reached out to someone that had worked at Salesforce saying, hey, I can build websites. I don't you know, I've been trying to look for a marketing job. And this person who was a um uh, you know, everything starts with relationships. She was like, yeah, of course, meet this person named Matt Stodolnik tomorrow and see what happens. And 48 hours later, I had a uh, an internship that turned into a job over school at this company called Salesforce. It was 800 people at the time. I did not know the significance of where I was at till did later. You get options? Uh, so because I was an intern, like it was just like, for me, I was like, let me just get paid, do my work. Yeah. Like these are all the things you learn later in life, right? right? Like, if I could right. replay back time, it'd be like, Ryan, 800 people, just go all in, right? Yeah, um, yeah. 
you know, the two companies being celebrated at the time were Google for its, you know, re rechanging the ad and, and online search space, and then Salesforce by shifting software online. And so for me, incredible learning experience. I ended up going to Microsoft actually uh, for a good three to four year stint um, instead of seeing it Salesforce. Because for me, in the way that at least I was trained was like, go to the big companies, learn how they work, learn everything about how they operate because you could use those lessons. And actually a lot of the success that I had in government, I do thank Microsoft for, right? Because Microsoft at the time, 60,000 people, multiple layers, divisions. How do you do the work that you have to, but also deal with the politics as well too. Um, but everybody who lives in Silicon Valley gets the itch to start a company. So that next four year stretch was about building a company. I, uh, you know, mobile phones are coming out and you had the iPad and it was like, wow, data being collected on this could be radically different. And so I, uh, my uh, co-founder, Jimmy Doe, and I started a company doing that. It evolved into a company focused in the healthcare space because there were people using it there. Um, we raised uh, a round of funding, got uh, supported by a group called Rock Health. And so this journey for me at this point, because this is the buildup to how did I get in the government was seeing what Salesforce could do to make enterprises work better, going to Microsoft and being part of the office for Mac suite and really changing how people work, right? Like making their, you know, you open up Microsoft Outlook or Gmail these days for most folks, but you know, you're in Outlook more than 12 hours a day if your job is intense or maybe six hours a day if it's a normal thing. And if you can make those improvements there, you can make someone's life a lot better and their work more productive. And so for me, the shift to healthcare was like, look how broken this is. Like I could build a company here that could make that better. Um, one thing you realize very quickly is healthcare is big. <laughs> healthcare is daunting. Um, trying to change it from the outside, you can maybe fix a corner of it, but healthcare is very local. Healthcare is very hard to fix the like, you know, um, tech side of it. And there was this opportunity in DC that came about to be what they called a presidential innovation fellow. And there was an application online that uh, you could fill out that said, these are the projects, what do you think about them? And I saw one that was dealing with health records and helping unlock them for you and I, right? Our health records are at all these hospitals and places, but how do I get them? And my application was the biggest critique of how it's done today, right? I was like, oh, we need to get access to them so entrepreneurs could do really good things for patients. And not just that, transparency is a really good thing. Critique, 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 you know? And I was like, ah, oh, that's it. They're not gonna call me back. And uh, a couple of months go by, I get this incredible call and a whole couple of, like I think a day or two of interviews. And at the end of it, it was, it was a simple ask, like, can you move to DC in two weeks? Wow. And, you know, when the White House asks you, can you move to D.C. in two weeks, you you say yes, uh, mm -hmm. no matter what administration it is, by the way, like you, you say yes, because for me in that moment, I saw an opportunity to work in government, this big, big thing and shape it for the better. So it's like a big ship. And if I could turn it just a little bit, like some really good things could happen in the healthcare side. Whereas in the startup world, I can move really fast. Like it's like a speedboat, but I'm causing no waves, right? And so I said, yes, I joined as a presidential innovation fellow in the Department of Health and Human Services, six month stint and absolutely loved it. Like it was a mix of being really curious, a mix of seeing problems and trying to solve them. And really, I think the, the, the way that I was successful there was realizing there are a lot of people in government that have come before me. Um, there are a lot of other experts out there. And knowing that I'm not going to be there forever, right, in this organization, how do we, like, lift up everyone together? How do you find the two to three other people that have the same idea as you? If it's low-hanging fruit, likely there are people out there that have said this is an issue as well. And so it was really working as a partner, right, me as a technologist with the policymaker, with the doctor, with really ensuring that at the table, you've got all the right people, right? You know, government usually may just have a policy, like a policy, like round table or just lawyers. And the, the quick learning here, in, uh, at least my experience in DC was 
augment them, add the technologist, add the parent, add the doctor, add the, you know, really create a kitchen cabinet that helps shape these things. And so I stayed on month, uh, sorry, every, you know, keep, kept on re-extending every six months. My wife was out in California. I kept flying back and forth. And the moment when I was about to return was this October 1st, 2013 crisis that came about, right? The healthcare.gov work. And that to me changed everything. Like I was working on the edges of government as a presidential innovation fellow, really entrepreneurial, trying to get access to health records and open data and so forth. But working on healthcare.gov was helping out on a critical piece of legislation for the president, President Obama and his team at the time, right? The Affordable Care Act said, we're gonna get health insurance to people. And the way that we do that is through this website and it not working and being part of that rescue team changed everything for me. So, wow. Wow. Uh, I love the kind of the, the behind the scenes stories of how we get to places. Cause it's, it's, to me, it makes it more interesting as we're making our own career decisions, thinking about stories like yours about working at a big company for the purpose of learning, starting your own company. Cause you're kind of surrounded by that, where you live, like that's what we're going to do you know, applying for this, this huge role that you probably think I'm not going to get this thing. And then you, and then you, then they give you two weeks and you go, and then you're flying back and forth to see your wife and you're in DC and you stay a lot longer than you originally anticipated. Like, I, th I think those are the stories that kind of inspire people as we're all building our careers and you're in the middle of yours as well, that, that, that part, um, is inspiring. And, and, and now you were at Kleiner Perkins and, mm -hmm. Um, you work closely with John Doerr and he's, he's, he's kind of a legend. I mean, he's probably, I mean, is he, is he the greatest venture capitalist of all time? Um, some would say as far as the people he's invested in Amazon, all early Amazon, Google into it, Netscape, many, many others. Uh, how, do, how did then that come about to where you get kind of partnered? You're working side by side with, with literally one of the greatest living venture capitalists of all time. He, um, he is legendary, and he's also one of the most thoughtful, caring people that I've that I've ever met. Really, he, um, you know, my at least the way that I've always approached my career has always been twofold. One has been be great at what you do, right? Like it's this idea of being excellent, but always ensure you're learning, right? And if you're if you're kind of hitting a plateau on that learning bit, maybe it's time for change, right? Like maybe it means looking at a different role within a company. Maybe it means going to a different place and, and really surrounding yourself by other people to push you. And so in coming back from DC, like I had a hunger to build something new and that's how I ended up at Kleiner to begin with. But to work with John was doing something different than what I was, you know, like, like what I would call my day job, which was like, you know, being a product person, being an engineer, like trying to start something. Whereas shifting into this more of truly in the beginning, this apprentice like role, right? I mean, you know, John Doerr has this incredible history of taking on people under his wing and uh, through trial by fire, like having you learn. And it really comes from Andy Grove, who is the CEO of Intel. Uh, Jeff Bezos also does this as well as Bill Gates. They have a role called the technical assistant, also sometimes known as the chief of staff. Um, and it is a, if you're from DC, you know what that role means and stands for, but in the tech world, it's kind of similar. And what, what it is, is um, Bill and Jeff and John, what they do is they take one of their executives and place them as a effective kind of shadow that helps leverage their time, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, the current CEO of Amazon was Jeff Bezos's technical assistant. A lot of the great leaders at Microsoft were Bill Gates's technical assistants. And it's this sort of theory that find great people that are working with you and for you and bring them into the room and trial by fire, they you know learn and grow. And so for me, the first two years of my experience with John was really about that. And wow. it was seeing how he invests. It was helping support the companies that he had already invested in and being in, you know, the board seat position, as well as finding new investments. And um, 
incredible, like, like the amount of notes that I have from the experience. Uh, I can't wait to share more of them with the, with the world because just the things that you can see at that high pace um, is incredible. That's maybe perhaps the other uh, kind of takeaway in, in, in a career choice. Um, one of my, um, I would call him a mentor and colleague, DJ Patil, who was chief data scientist at LinkedIn, also the data scientist for the country when I was working together with him. We would always talk about how fast is life playing back right now, right? Like, are you, is it just a normal year? Or are we doing the amount of work that two, you know, does it feel like it's going two times uh, either faster or slower, whichever way you want to say it? Or are you packing in four times as much or six times as much? And like, I, I think that's like a, a testament to growth. Like for me in DC, it felt like that healthcare.gov experience in particular, it was only, you know, six months, but the core of it was a month. That month felt like a year. And like, that's when you know you're growing, you're changing, you're shaping. And so, um, my time with John has truly been like every month feels like not a month, but like four months and six wow. months. We're just packing things in it. And it's been, it has been incredible. He, uh, and, yeah. he could probably pick anyone that would take that role. Why did he pick you? Um, you know, when, when he uh, was looking for a person to work with, he was looking for uh, a combination of these things. And um, he was looking for an engineer. He was looking for someone that had worked, uh, 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 sorry, was an engineer, started a company, uh, possibly uh, had experience in government and maybe even in healthcare. And there was a few other qualities, but those four, I was like, oh my gosh, that's me. Like I've been in government. I've like worked and started a healthcare company. Like I'm an engineer, like and a founder. And it was like, ah, like. Did he po like post this somewhere and you, and you see like a, like a job posting or like how, how did you find this out? Oh, in an interview, he was like, this is my criteria. Like, he's a very transparent person, like in making decisions. Like, he was like, this is what I am looking for. And, you know, we were ticking them off. And, and one of them, one of the criteria on the list was to have finance experience, right? To be possibly have investor experience. And I remembered in the interview, I prepared a, an answer for it. Like, it was like a three paragraph answer in my head, right? Because I, I had no investment experience, right? And he's going down this list and we're having a fun conversation about all of these. And then we get to this one. And before I say anything, he's like, nope, you don't have this, but I'll teach you. And then jump to the next one. And I was like, wow. Oh, wow. wow. Um, so obviously you killed it in the interview. Uh, <laughs> what, what are, what are, and you've, you've interviewed well, like you mentioned like, oh, it's Salesforce, Microsoft, like, like that part was just obvious. They would hire you. It's not obvious. You know, it's, you had to earn that. What are some, for someone who's, you know, in the stage right now, and I have friends who are asking me about this, they're interviewing for big jobs, big leadership roles, promotions, sometimes at their same company, sometimes at different ones. What, wh how do you prepare for these big moments, these big interviews, whether it was like in the early jobs when you get an internship and then yeah. you get full time, like I said, you had to get interviewed to, to work for the, for, for our country. Um, you had an interview with John and it seems like you kind of pass the test every time. What are some of the ways you think about the interview process when you're the one being interviewed? Yeah, totally. I, um, this is assuming like you've got, you know, being great at what you do. Like that's, that's a default, right? Like yep. let's assume that. Table but stakes, to gotta do, be great. Yeah, exactly. Be, be good or great at what you do and be honest about it as well too, because people, when they're in interview, can easily see through things if, if you start to stretch uh, some of that. But the part that really stands out is I think if you're really curious, right? Like you actually care a lot about the company you're going to work for and the work that it does, because it does show. Um, it shows in the interview, it shows in the questions that you're asking. And that I always see as like, uh, uh, as what separates folks out. Like an example being even like for advice on how to work at a startup and get the attention of, you know, the executive team there. Um, it isn't just like, hey, Ryan, I want to go work for your, your company. It's like, hey, I saw you have a role for this. I think I would be great because of this. And I think we should, you know, steer your company in this direction, right? Like these would be some great ideas. Like really show the person you're interviewing with how you think, what you could do in that role. And like, really, I mean, remember in this interview, the person that's usually on the other side is going to be a teammate. It's going to be a colleague. It may be your boss. And so like really 
showing that this relationship that we're about to get in together, right, i.e. this partnership, is going to be a great one. And I, I found that being a, a good way to approach interviews is that this is a partnership. This isn't you quizzing me. This isn't you like putting me through the ringer. It's like truly like, hey, if this goes well, we're going to spend the next two, four years together. So let's make it great. Yeah, you've actually thought through enough and are curious enough to think about potential problems and maybe ways to solve some of them, or at least some ideas that you've actually thought that through as opposed to just trying to sell yourself and why you're awesome. But you've actually thought about ways to make, So my dad told me when I first got a real job, he's like, you know, your job is to make your boss's life easier. Oh, yes. So, so just always be finding ways. Like so sales job will crush your number. That will make his life easier. I promise you. Other <laughs> things that he doesn't like to do, yeah. you know, raise your hand to do those. In addition to crushing your number, like those types of things. And it it sounds simplistic, but if you're if you're kind of north star, especially I think as a newer person when you're an entry level or frontline job, like a lot of us have when we start, or pretty much all of us have when we start, it's what are the problems that that person has that I report to and how can I solve some of them and how can totally. I make their life better? If you are constantly working on that and you're good at that, you'll have a place. You'll have a place, you know? It's this uh, make them look great because yeah. it's not just them. Like that's your team, right? Like right. make your team look great and the momentum will flow. But I think there are some cases where folks have managers that could be bad managers, right? Yeah. And in those cases, like, you know, diagnose that. And like, if you're at a larger company, thankfully there are other opportunities, right? So you can shift and move. And I think one kind of thing I've been very lucky at is I've had great mentors, i.e. bosses. I really do look at my bosses as mentors. You know, people say search for a mentor, but there's really honestly no better mentor than your boss because they are your coach. And from like, you know, Matt at Salesforce, Christy at, uh, at, at Microsoft, all the way to like Megan Smith at the White House, like these are incredible leaders that we're always willing to teach. And so it yeah. always comes back to that. It's like, find the boss that's going to grow you as well as the one that you you feel pretty awesome making them look great. And it's like, that's like a really good relationship. And I think if you do find yourself in the position where they maybe they're not a good boss or they're not a good manager, not a good leader. Um, I, most of us have been there. I, I certainly have. I found it helps to kind of change your perspective to say, this is temporary and I'm going to treat this as almost like a school, like this is where I'm learning. I'm learning what not to do. <laughs> um, and if you view it that way, it can help make those times a little bit better knowing like, this is not going to be forever. Like totally. we'll find, we'll find, I'll find my way out of this. But while I'm here, yeah. I want to learn from them. I want to learn basically like approach with Liz Weissman just said this to me, like approach them with curiosity. I wonder how they got that way. I wonder why they are that way. Yeah. Let's, let's document right? Keep the journal of, of things they do that just aren't effective and make sure we don't totally. ever become that person. Cause it's easy to lose perspective as you rise the ranks and you get promoted. Uh, so Ryan, one of the things I, that you do at, at Kleiner and, and, and obviously your work with John is you have to basically place bets on people. You're mm -hmm. investing in leaders, mm -hmm. which is why I thought you'd be an awesome guest for the show because you're constantly studying leaders and ideas and their products and their businesses. And, and, and you have to place a bet because you're investing sometimes pretty early where they're not Salesforce or Google yet. They could be right, but, but they're not yet. So what are some of the, the must have qualities and leaders for you to invest in them? Totally. Um, when you do early stage investment, right? Like in the venture capital world, there's the full range. There's like the seed investment. This is like when a company doesn't even exist. There's what they call the series A investment, which is a company has been around for a little while and you know they've got something going for them, maybe a product or something, but maybe not to market yet. And that's a series A, but it goes beyond to the B, like the B round, the C round, the D round, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. When you go down that cycle, there's a lot of data to measure if the company's doing well or not. But to your question, it's really about how do you invest in this earliest stage when there's just an idea, just a team of Because you guys do a, the whole scope, right? 
We, you know, at Kleiner, we focus on seed and series A, but Kleiner, uh, from when I started, we had a growth team that also did later stage. And so okay. I had the benefit from learning from, you know, Mary Meeker and Noah and a whole crew of really great investors on that side. And you've got to lean on data there, right? Like mm-hmm. the data doesn't lie, right? But you can believe in the people that they can maybe steer it. On this earliest side, all you have is a person's, um, you know, if you know them, you know how they work, you know their grit, you know what they're capable, you know how they're a leader. Um, what you'll actually often see, you know, there are patterns of how folks invest. One of them is, this is a person I've worked with before. I know what they're capable of. And that's like, a you'll see a lot of seed and series A investments really follow that trend. What you'll also see is that you're going to see, let's say you actually haven't worked with this person before, but they've got a great background, right? They've Mm -hmm. seen what it takes to take a company from a few people to a thousand or more. And so, you know, they have the, what they call the track record. And so it's finding leaders who've been exposed to these things, finding leaders who um, have that track record that they know how to build this kind of company. And the reason why you're looking for these things is the road is not going to be a straight line. And so you need a founder that's going to really uh, navigate that grit and hold on to this vision. And so this is one where, you know, a lot of the venture community will say this and, and most mean it that, you know, we're founder first, we're founder friendly. And, and what we mean by that is um, five years from now or 10 years from now, uh, that founder is going to still be there fighting for that company. You know, they could be a publicly traded company. They could be a private company. They could still be struggling, but that founder is still there. And you want to back that founder and that person that's going to be able to do that. Because what we've also found is, at least in the venture capital world, is if you lose a founder, you lose that spark. And so that's the other thing you look for, not just the track record and what they've done and their experience, but you look across the table at this this entrepreneur, she or he, and you say, can we together go through the hard times and the good times? Does this person have the right people around them as well, too, to support them? Also knowing, by the way, that cast of characters may change. And so you really are making a decision at a point in time about the decade ahead. And so it isn't this fly by night kind of thing where people are throwing checks out. It might look like that from when you zoom out, but when you go and you talk about, uh, you know, to any of these, any of the investment colleagues and funds that we have, everyone usually believes that the person they're investing in is going to create something great. 10 years from now, when you look back on it, That's where you hear those sayings that it's like, well, out of, you know, 10 investments, only one shines or, you know, out of a fund, only a few companies return it. But in that moment, in that first day, when you meet that founder, you're like, I believe in you. Like, this is going to be a billion dollar idea. You know, that's the criteria for making the investment at the beginning with. So I I got advice early in my career that you interview for your next job every single day. And Mm -hmm. I think it's so true even in your, your world. Cause what, what did you just say? A number of, a number of those decisions are made based on relationships. Mm-hmm. And so I think as early as possible, and I didn't learn this early enough, but as early as possible, always think about how can I build genuine, mutually beneficial relationships with other people, with, with, with other people like that I want to be around. Cause you, you, you never know. You never know where people are going to be, what they're going to be doing, which, which referral they may make from you 10 years from now that will change your life. You just never know. And I, and I think that's like one of the critical pieces of advice of how can I play the long game and build actual real, not transactional, but transformational relationships with other people that we're actively seeking and trying to find ways to help each other. And if you do that, 
I just feel like good things seem to happen. Like you don't know where or how or who, but it seems to work out when you, when you behave that way. And it's more fun too, you know, like, Oh yeah. I like, yeah. I like Ryan. He's a good dude. We talked, it was great. And he introduced me to so-and-so and now, Oh yeah. Here, you know, like that type of thing happens if that's just your standard kind of default setting. And, and that's the advice I try to give people that I wish I would have taken a lot earlier in my life that now you see, you can, you reap so much, so many benefits from it. Totally. I, uh, I think of it as like build community, right? Yeah. Like, uh, cause we're going to be on this road together. We don't know when we're going to cross paths again, but for all of the doors that have opened for me from that Salesforce job to even the Kleiner opportunity, you know, being there was because of building community and actually just being present when meeting other people, Mm. giving without knowing what's going to come back and and staying in touch as well, too. You know, like uh, our work lives and our personal lives are on different train tracks, right? You know, we, we spend a lot of time building community in our personal lives with friends and family and investing there. It's okay to do the same in your professional life too, because I think maybe this comes from the lens of being probably from the Valley, from uh, an idea that we're always going to build something new together and work together. Is that like, we all look at each other as potential colleagues, maybe in the future. Mm -hmm. right? Or collaborators or someone to bounce an idea off of. And so uh, build community. That's Well, I I had Ryan Peterson, CEO of Flexport. And and he was like, you know, what's kind of like a, I don't know if it's a secret or what people don't realize is everyone around me is a phone call away and they will open up everything. They will tell me anything and everything I want. And I try to do the same. And it seems like people don't realize like how giving and kind people are around the area where he's like, I call random CEOs or people that are of these giant companies and I'll ask them personal or what some may seem deemed sensitive questions. And they just answer them. And he's like, it's so cool. It's like, there's so many people who are giving and kind and they want to help. And it makes me He's saying him, me want to do it for others as well. But that's because he's giving in kind, yes. right? Like, right. like I'm sure you, like his work during COVID, just giving, 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 yep. right? Yep. Not only on the philanthropic side. Do you work with them, by the way, or no? I, I do not. I mean, okay. but him and I, like, it's like, you just see that generosity online as well as how other people talk about him as well, too. Yeah. And so, um, it's cool. It's also like you, by doing that, uh, this is, I remember when I had Jim Collins on and he talked about his mentor, Bill Lazier, who he wrote a book with, and they had this thing called the trust wager. Basically like, I'm going to make the trust wager that I'm going to lead with trust. Mm. And part of the reason you do that is one, it's just a more enjoyable way to live, even though you get burned every once in a while. But, but, but two, and a really key point, you'll start attracting those types of people. And you'll also start pushing away the ones who are not like that. Because mm-hmm. if you're the person who doesn't lead with trust, you're probably not going to attract trustworthy people to you. We all know, can think of those people who are like super cynical and they, they think everyone's going to rip them off. They're always surrounded by like not loyal, untrustworthy people versus the ones like Ryan Peterson we're talking about where we both know him and how he leads with trust. Everyone kind of opens their books for the guy and he does the same isn't that a much more fun way to live? Like that's a much more enjoyable way to go about life. And in my mind, even if every once in a while, somebody takes advantage of you, I still think it's worth it. You know, it is worth it. I agree with you. If it, if it means being nice 10 times and one person taking advantage of you. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the better pattern to play. You know? Um, so I, I, I watched a um, uh, presentation you gave Ryan on, and we're shifting a little bit, but I, I on, on OKRs and KPIs. Ah, yes. Okay. Okay. Now, OKRs and KPIs, some people are like, oh God, will you stop with the acronyms? Uh, and sometimes I say that too, but OKRs and KPIs. And, and, and I, I want to get to speed and scale in a second too, but I think measure what matters is important because it's a, it's a, it's a book that every leader should read um, to, to, to start here with certainly with your story, because I know you helped John write that book, but can you share, so for the person who let's say they're a VP at a fortune 100 company, and they're, they're running a team, you know, they're trying to do all the things, build culture, hit the numbers they need to hit all of the, all of the goals. What, what, what is it about OKRs and KPIs? Yeah. And you could share what those mean and, and, and how like the, the foundational at a foundational level, 
what that person should do from like a philosophical standpoint of, of, of implementing those into their business. Totally. So let's take one of your uh, pieces of trust, right? Mm-hmm. Like a leader that uh, builds trust, you will follow, right? Because you feel that that quality is there. The other one is clarity, right? And so getting clarity of direction. So if you have trust and direction, most teams can do anything. And so um, objectives and key results, that's what OKR stand for. Um, It's a goal setting tool that John learned from Andy Grove at Intel. And that John has taken to companies from Google to the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation and so forth. And all it is, Ryan, is just a simple, goal setting tool that asks, what is our objective? What are we trying to accomplish? And then if we get there, right, what are the key results? How do we know if we've accomplished it? The what's in the how's, objectives and key results, OKRs. And the neat thing about OKRs when they're done well is that they're really simple, right? It asks a leader, what are we trying to change in the year ahead? Or what are we trying to change in the quarter ahead? and articulated on something that fits on an index card, which can be really hard these days, right? We have strategy conversations and leadership decks and, you know, it's just like PDF after PDF. And what OKRs do is say, hey, let's get crystal clear about what success looks like in the timeframe you're looking at, right? Like the year ahead. And let's actually put milestones and markers and the measures that really matter. And if we do that today, and we chart our course over the course of the year and keep reflecting back on those measures, we'll know if we get there. We'll know, of, co- of course, also for or for falling short and if we need to course correct. And it really ends up being this kind of rallying cry for an organization and what success looks like. And hey, I need everybody else to fill in the gaps. And so what I like to say is OKRs, you use them to lead your organization. And if you can write a great set of OKRs, you likely are a very good leader because you've got that clarity piece, piece down. And what OKRs will do is they let your organization focus on what matters. It aligns you to uh, the priorities, right? Because you say yes or no to things. It gets this commitment across the organization. It's trackable because everything's measured. And if done well, everyone will stretch. So you've got OKRs to lead. KPIs, JIRA, roadmaps, and all those things, you need them too, but you use those to manage. And so that's like the reminder, OKRs, you craft those because that's how you're leading and steering your company. What's different about the world today? And then you have other lists like your KPIs and your hit lists and your to-dos that help you manage the actual work that's getting done. So OKRs and the other stuff. And so Measure What Matters has been this book around the concept. We've got a website called whatmatters.com that has even more resources around it. But I think any team can benefit from trying to articulate their goals as OKRs. Key performance indicators for KPIs of yes. what, are the, what are the key measurements for us to, to perform, to hit, to hit what we want to hit. Totally. And so yep. you should have lots of KPIs, right? The things yep. that we're tracking at all times. I like so, to say KPIs are for like health measures. For your but, job, like how, how, how do you guys, do, like for, how about for you specifically, do you have your own set of OKRs and KPIs that, that say like, okay, Ryan's doing a good job. Uh, he, he, he's, is, how does that work? Yeah, uh, I, I do. I, I mean, well, we do, right? Kleiner yep. as a firm, we have OKRs for us. Like what does success look like? Yep. And, you know, the, the monetary side of the work we do is part of the given stuff, right? Those are the KPIs that we're always tracking. But our OKRs at Kleiner are really about how do we become a better venture capital firm? How do we serve our founders even better? And that's where our OKRs come from. From like the personal world of myself, right? It's even asking the same question to me, right? It's like, what do I want to change about my life? these next 90 days? What do I want to change about my life the year ahead and crafting OKRs around that, right? Is there a health goal that I'm trying to accomplish? And what are the KRs around that? Is there a family priority piece that that, that comes about? I mean, for us, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of, um, it's really rewarding to teach people how to use OKRs because in these conversations, what surface are not only the priorities that matter, matter but like, a conversation around what success looks like. Is it here? Is it an incremental goal we're setting? Are we trying to do something radically different? And based on the goal you set, it kind of changes your tactics. Gotcha. 
and now most recently, um, Speed and Scale. So another book that you've you've written with John that sets a, a, a really ambitious goal. Can you talk more about what ski, Speed and Scale is about and why you and John uh, felt like you were the guys that, that needed to write this book and get it out into the world? Totally. So Speed and Scale is an action plan for solving our climate crisis. And it started from a conversation back Christmas 2019, right before the, the COVID pandemic. Um, we were talking about if you could take the climate crisis, which was an issue, is an issue that John has been working on for almost two decades. And can we unpack it using OKRs, right? Like, how would that look like? And we set out on this journey the way we do probably actually anything, even our investments. When there's a new space or a new problem, go to the experts, have conversations with them. And so um, because of COVID, it unlocked this ability to do Zooms with pretty much anybody in the world to ask them questions about, well, the emissions that we emit, why are they happening? What are the sources? How do we tackle the ones from transportation? How do we tackle the ones from our energy grid or our food system? What actually moves the needle? And so what Speed and Scale is, is it's an action plan with incredible stories of founders doing amazing things like Lynn Jurich of Sun One, how she grew her solar company into this you know, billion dollar company that's put solar panels all across the country to Ethan Brown, the founder of Beyond Meat and his story, the origin story, all the way to, you know, uh, you've got Margot Brown pushing for climate justice in this transition, Bill Gates on the importance of innovation. And uh, the book is an articulation of leaders trying to tackle this climate crisis, Ryan. And that's what makes it special. Wow. Uh, what was the process for you to write it? Like how, how was it with John and having a partner like this where you yeah. guys are, you're both on the cover? Like how, how, how was that? Uh, you know, completely iterative, completely about, um, you know, we were fortunate to have a pretty good team. Like it was more than just us in the book. You know, we do something different in the book, which is usually acknowledgements are saved to the back of the book, but in the front that, you know, second page you turn over, it's like everyone that was helping us with writing, we both are engineers. So we're not always the best writers, but we are like good thinkers, uh, but um, researchers, data analysts, and the process was, well, what are the important objectives? Let's start there. What are the important measures that say we're successful? And then how do we pair those with stories that show that it's possible to move the needle? And so what we want Speed and Scale to be is this rallying cry to leaders to say, hey, this crisis that's on our doorstep, we can cut our emissions. And this is where they are. And not only that, these are the measures that matter, right? So to say that in, in transportation, if we can electrify our fleets, we're cutting six gigatons of emissions. And this is where we have to go. And so for us, it was saying this book could be a tool for leaders. It could show them where their leverage could be applied. Um, and, and, and that was the, that's like, I hope the exciting part of this is like every page you flip is like, you see the data, you see the inspirational story, you see the measure. And if you make it through the book, you walk away feeling, I know more about the crisis that's in front of us. But more than that, I know what to do, right? Mm -hmm. I know what the leverage points are. Um, yeah. Love it, man. Uh, what's next for you? What, what, like, do you have plans? What are you thinking? Yeah, this, um, this book is a campaign, right? Speed and scale is a campaign. Um, for us, success, actually, it's going to seem kind of counterintuitive, right? Um, is that the 2,000 leaders in the world, that's right, just 2,000 leaders in the world, pick it up, and because of it, do something more ambitious and do something faster to tackle this crisis that's in before us. And what that means is it's the, you know, 500 CEOs of the Fortune 500. It means it's the leaders of the 20 top emitters around the world. It means it's the, you know, 20 to 40 entrepreneurs that are going to start companies that make it possible to have sustainable air fuel that's carbon neutral and all these things. So for us, it's really getting to those 2,000 leaders that are going to make the biggest difference here. 
And to be quite honest, like tackling this crisis is also the greatest opportunity of our lives, right? It is an economic transformation. We think about disrupting incumbents, the businesses that will be created, the uh, winds and changes to our community, like breathing better air, um, the kind of like equity and justice that it will create around the world of like actually giving people energy security. Like it, it is momentous. It is incredible. This is the decisive you know, we say decade, but really it's a decisive year. 2022 is all about leaders taking action on this topic and feeling really proud of it as well, too. Because honestly, Ryan, you're, you're, you're in my generation or the ones that are going to have to pay this down. Um, yeah. Love it, man. Um, Ryan, man, I really appreciate you being here. I, I'd encourage people to go to speedandscale.com as well as buy the book. Um, it's, it's pretty, like, I love... Uh, I just love people who who really dream big, you know, and, and, and go for it and have the guts to kind of put it out there for people to judge. And I think that's obviously what you guys are doing. It's, it's, it's really cool. And I, I think reading measure what matters is also super, uh, if you haven't already a, a very good use of, of your time and where else would you send uh, viewers, listeners to, to learn more about you online? Ooh, speed and scale.com. What matters.com. Those are the two places um, at Speed and Scale, you can download, anybody can for free, the action plan, which is those objectives and key results, the 10 objectives and the 55 key results. It's a, a lovely poster for anybody who's actually watching it. But um, nice. the, 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 the beauty of, I think, the moment we're in right now is all it takes is a handful of leaders setting really ambitious and audacious goals and us following through with them. Like, I think that's the optimist in me, like really feeling like we can do this. Um, but it, it would also be important to say the urgency of all this too. And so, you know, the IPCC, which is the UN's uh, Committee on Climate Change, just a couple of weeks ago, put out a report that said, hey, we've been saying the world is getting warmer. But actually, you know, the degrees, the one and a half degrees, which, by the way, means it's like multiple degrees warming on the poles. So that's why ice melts. We've got 400 gigatons left. If we emit more than 400, we get warmer by this much. If we emit 600, 700, it gets a lot warmer. But we finally have a target. And I think for all of us and probably everyone listening, like talking about it as this vague thing that's going to get warmer might feel distant. But 400, we've got a target that's the amount of missions we have left to keep below one and a half. And guess what? We can set some goals around it. They're going to be hard, but yeah. I think we can do it. Love it, man. Well, thanks so much for, for sharing uh, your personal story as well as all of the great work you've done and, 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 and learning more about your career. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun, man. Thank you, Ryan. It was wonderful being here. And I'd certainly love to uh, continue our dialogue uh, as we both progress, man. Always, always, always. All right, man. Thanks so much.